This is a presentation of the University of Wisconsin Parkside. My name is Jonathan Shaler. I'm the director of the program in conflict analysis and resolution and uh, associate professor of communication here at the University of Wisconsin Parkside. And I would like to greet our honored guest, uh, Imam Muhammad Hamad of the Islamic Society of Sheboygan. So welcome. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jonathan uh, Shaler, uh, for this invitation. And I would like also to thank uh, Dr. Faye Hendis for uh, um, this invitation, and I'm happy to be uh, uh, in the uh, University of Wisconsin Parkside. That's great, thank you. I have a brief uh, biography here that I'll, I'll read, and hopefully I'll pronounce everything correctly. If I don't, maybe you'll correct me. Uh, Muhammad Hamad is Imam, President, and one of the founders of the Islamic Society of Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Professionally, he's a mechanical engineer with a consulting firm in Sheboygan designing water and wastewater treatment facilities. Imam Muhammad was born and raised in Beit Hanun, close enough, a village north of Gaza in Palestine. He grew up on a farm. After high school, he earned a degree in business from the UNRWA Institute in Gaza, then traveled to Sudan, Africa, where he earned a degree in engineering. He moved to the United States in May 2000 and earned a master's degree in electrical engineering from Western Michigan University. Imam Muhammad is actively involved in educational programs to explain Islam, Muslim culture, and American Muslim duties, rights, and needs. He's delivered lectures and participated in dialogues to different faith groups, as well as universities and high schools. So uh, again, welcome. And uh, your society or Muslim community in Sheboygan has been very much in the news uh, beginning last year when there was some uh, community resistance to the creation of a mosque in Sheboygan and that uh, of course was something that was going on and still is across the country from the uh, site two blocks from the World Trade Center and uh, mosques in Tennessee, and California, Florida. We have about 1,900 mosques in, in the country right now. I don't know how many of them have been under siege, but uh, a notable amount. And I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the Muslim community in, in Sheboygan, how it, how it formed, and then maybe we could get to the harder part. Uh, first of all, Mr. Jonathan, I believe you know, we have around 2,200 you know, mosques around the United States and over 21 mosques in Wisconsin. Uh, some of them, you know, big communities and some of them very small communities. When you say very small community, there's that 50 families, you know, that's members of this community. Uh, it was uh, difficult for us as a Muslim community living in Sheboygan between Green Bay and Milwaukee to practice our own religion. And we, as a Muslim, moved to the United States, we believe that the constitution that we grant for everyone the right to practice their own religion. And based on that fact, you know, we found that it's gonna be an easy journey to establish a place of worship because this is what, you know, the ancestor and the founder of this country, you know, they faced and they moved to this country. I started, you know, uh, searching, and if you know that it was uh, a uh, funny story to know that I lived in Sheboygan for almost six months knowing that there is no Muslim family in that area. And I used to travel during the night to Milwaukee to do some prayers, during, especially during Ramadan, which is we have a quoted Taraweeh prayers after you break your fast, especially in Aisha prayers. So it was a very difficult moment for me, and I decided, you know, Sheboygan, it's a very nice area to raise my family if I want to raise my family. The other aspect is not just the materialistic things in this life. There is a spiritual thing, where it is making the human being as a human being walking in this area. I found myself that one day in the market and a woman with a scarf walking in front of me, and I was shocked if there is a Muslim family in this town. And I stopped here, <laughs> and which is unusual you know, for a Muslim made him to stop to ask. I said, can I ask you, are you living here? She said, yes. I said, 
are you married? She said, yes. I said, can I, can I have your husband's phone number? She said, yes. She was from Syria. I called her husband immediately. And he was happy to hear that there is a Muslim also member in that area. He lived in, Shub in Shuboyim the last 40 years, from 1971. And he raised family, his kids uh, in the 40s. And they involved in every way in Shibuya. So we met at the said, you know, just can we think of place of worship? We want to worship just normally. And he said, I know a couple of families from Bosnia and Albania, and I know a doctor also. And they started from that family. We start gathering in my apartment, small apartment, to do Friday prayers, and then we move to the next step renting a place, uh, apartment, and then we move to the third step, which is finding a place. Finding a place uh, was a difficult choice. And because how you want to satisfy all the needs of a community, they are living around 25 to 30 miles around that area. And sometimes, this is what I believe, when you choose a place of worship, you think you choose it by yourself, but you are guided to do it. So every one member of the community, when we enter that building, we felt it. This is the place we can make it, you know, a place of worship. Uh, it's not, you know, um, it's just a feeling inside me. And we, all of us, we agreed about that. So the story of that, you know, <laughs> Normally, as any story uh, of any community, they want to practice spiritual uh, their life, but we found it that it was a journey. It need it has some obstacles, and uh, I'm happy that you know last year May 17 we had that over. I'm going to ask the stupid questions. That's what I'm up here for. Um, <clears throat> at least that's no, the role I've assigned to myself. Okay. Um, I guess, you know, um, I grew up Catholic and I, you know, the, the, the church was down the street and, you know, people have been coming to that church for years. How does a religious community form that did not exist before? And I guess an, an, an allied question with that is, um, you know, there were, there were Bosnian, Albanian families, you mentioned Syrian, you're from uh, Gaza. Um, how did all these people end up within a 30 mile radius of each other? and? you know, say, hey, let's start up the mosque. <laughs> it just, uh, you need one from each member, from each community. And that's how each one, they know the others. And when we invited, you know, people from Pakistan or India, they know at least three, four families. From Albania, they know 10, 15, 20 families. From Bosnia, they know 20, 30 families. And that's how the community, they start the spread of the world, you know, around the community that we are seeking for a place of worship. And uh, that's how it started. You know, um, once I, the story that I know is that uh, Mansur Mirza, is that correct? Um, uh, a doctor, he um, found the building, or at least purchased, you found the building, the community found the building, he purchased the building. And it had to go through a process, it had to uh, be uh, made acceptable to the um, the town planning commission. So there was a town planning commission meeting, town planning board meeting? It, yes, it, it was before that, as soon as we applied you know, for that permission, there's a petition circling in, in, the, in the city of Oscar, which is uh, that petition that they wanted from the town not to grant us the permission. I, I called the reverends around that area and they had a meeting before actually we applied for the permission. And I met with 12 of them and we had discussion over, 12, uh, over two hours. And that discussion started that we are as a faithful community um, in different faith groups, we can work together and so on. But the response of, from those who lead the faith in that community was in a negative way. And in the end they say that if a Mormon or a Catholic church they're gonna open, we will come against that. And uh, 
and they ended their statement by saying, we pray for you to be a Christian. And I'm telling, you, telling them you know, after that, and I pray for them to be Christian too. I, I have here <laughs> some of the comments. Uh, this is according to Time Magazine that were made. Uh, uh, Muslims murder their children? Um, Christian kids have enough problems with drugs, alcohol, and pornography and should not have to worry about Islam too. I don't want it in my backyard, says one. Another says, I just think it's not America. So there were two petitions that uh, were circulated. Uh, and then at just hours before the planning meeting, there was another one with 90 signatures. Um, and that, uh, what I read was that that meeting was very emotional and very hurtful to uh, Mansoor. I don't know, what was your experience of that meeting? Uh, we experienced, you know, a hostile environment in that meeting. Uh, and we did not expect that as we are citizen. We lived in that area. We contribute to the county and we involve in uh, whether you know a doctor or engineers or other people they work in uh, cheese factories and so on and business like uh, restaurants and so on. So they involve all of them. Their face is known to them. But you trusted you know, you trusted your family with the position, but when it comes to practicing the religion, you know, you are different. It's not allowed for you. And you are afraid from, uh, from him or uh, from the, this religion. The hostile environment, it comes, uh, we find it with uh, people, you know, they have misunderstanding, lack of understanding about the Islam. And what we try to do to explain for them, this is not the Islam, but they don't. They did not give us the chance because the message wasn't from the people itself. It was from the leader of the faith groups in that area. Mm -hmm. Plus, we have some. Actually, I want to go back to that meeting mm -hmm. to explain one point. And I asked him in that meeting, if you are not coming to support, you know, us in this planning or in this permits, can I get from you? Um, a statement that say that you are not preach hate against Muslim community and he said that I would not preach in my church any hate against Muslims immediately three days after that they invited Bridget Gabriel and Wali Shabari yes which is both of them they have message anti-Islam and the consequences of that we found the petition again came so instead of um, not preaching any hate against you know minority or against a group of Muslims, they actually they increase that. They adding you know more guests around around the United States, and they start in coming in that area, small area, to deliver a different message. We found that that's very hateful, and we despair by that action. And I told them you know you promised me something, and you did something. In that point, I said, you know, I have to uh, let the, the media to know, as a Muslim here, what we are trying to do. And from that point, the media started, you know, uh, publishing, you know, and making an interview about this Muslim community. So one of the churches at Usburg brought Rajiv Gabriel to the to Usburg? Yes. Um, if people hear incredulity in my voice that you need to know who Brigitte Gabriel is. You need to look her up on the internet. Um, she is one of the most virulent uh, anti-Muslim uh, speakers in the, in the nation. So that, that's really uh, laying down the gauntlet. And who was the other speaker? Walid Shabat. It's another, you know, uh, Walid, if you search that, Walid Shabat is well known also. He called himself ex-terrorist, which is, he became um, compared to Christianity and start preaching against Muslim and uh, Muslim ideology and philosophy and you know Muslim in the United States. Yet in the face of all of this, the the, the uh, zoning commission uh, gave did they give approval at that meeting or conditional approval? We have conditional uh, uh, permits, which is for two years, and we have to renew it after two years, which is uh, uh, as I understand it from the law, which is. I have been told uh, there is no conditional use for place of worship. Actually, based on the Wisconsin law, 
you can make your house as a place of worship. You don't need to go to the state to do that. And that's what we found. But as a way, you are in that town and the hostile environment, we want to reach you know, the town hall or the town elected you know, officials to make it something uh, aware of what we are doing in that building. So they required modifications to the building? Yes, we did. We did modification in the building. The building wasn't, you know, uh, it was built as a school. It was in 1946. It used to be a school, and then uh, the owner converted as a health store. And after that, we had it. So we had to modify certain things. They asked for uh, occupancy, you know, issue, parking uh, lot, and, you know, uh, septic system to be uh, updated and so on. And how much time elapsed between the um, approval by the town planning commission and then the vote by the town board? It was a couple of months. Okay. And and what did anything go on in that in those two months? Uh, we had an incident, you know, after actually the approval, which is uh, stone thrown to the to the place, and some uh, some windows was broken. And we, we had some, you know, disturbance in that area. And we felt uh, the Muslim community, they felt in that insecure and unsafe. And I know for sure some family with their kids, they stopped coming because they felt there's a hostile uh, environment and they are afraid, you know, uh, something happened. But uh, the law enforcement assured us, you know, they would take care of all these things. And we did some modification for the building around it from shrubs and bushes and trees, and we clean everything to make it easy for the law enforcement to take care of the building. And uh, you consulted during this time with the Islamic Society of Milwaukee, and uh, was that helpful? Yes, uh, in Milwaukee, it's a, it's a bigger organization. They involve in many issues, <coughs> such kind of thing. They have uh, support teams when it comes, they involved in the, in the law enforcement. Uh, they guide us, you know, as a small group, uh, dedicated, we have full-time job, all of us, none of us, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, that's hired, you know, to run this organization, just we have full-time, we are volunteers to do that. So, Islamic Society of Milwaukee, they help us, and they guide us, and they give us advice, and they support us, which is that what we expected, actually, the most support we have it is not just from the Islamic Society of Milwaukee. We found 80% of the comments that's posted in these articles in Sheboygan County that's in support of Muslim rights to have place of worship. Because it, uh, it brought to the people or the residents in Sheboygan County many stories. And we, don't, we never know knows that this story is going to come uh, to the light and people they start talking about it. People they start talking about the stories that they used to date, you know, a girl from that, but because he's a Catholic, it's not allowed for him to get married. And actually people came, stopped by our place, and they told us face to face what uh, what happened to them in the 70s, that they barely beat them because they want to marry, you know, outside of their own faith. So these stories, they start coming in the media and they're coming as a comment and they starting, you know, throwing that. So we, we find ourselves uh, a cause for, uh, you know, for both green communities, especially Shogogin and Oldsburg, to uh, attack each other in comments and to defend you know, uh, each other. And we find also uh, people, you know, they have left the town because they found a hostile situation for them to live there uh, because they are different in what they're practicing in Christianity. And they left the town in a school. Uh, I remember they mentioned that the school that was uh, uh, they treat them differently because they are they are not first reformed, you know, uh, Presbyterian, you know, uh, followers. And that's what happened. So they start talking in the media and talking through the comments about uh, the Muslim and their rights and uh, attacking, you know, the people in Asperga, which is wasn't a pretty picture for us. But the whole thing it started coming in a way we don't anticipate that. So in a way, I don't know if you would agree with this, but it sounds like your presence in the creation of this mosque was a, a catalyst for a kind of community conversation about faith and tolerance. 
uh, believe me, it was, <laughs> it was for a while, you know, and uh, I'm working in a, in a company. They, they live in that town. And most of the engineers, that's the co-worker, my friends, they live in that town. And actually one of them, he said that, he said, Muhammad, you know, you don't know where you put yourself, you know. This is a very hostile environment. He said, I live there, but I don't practice, you know, I don't go to their church. So they, they understand that the environment there, it's not what they are looking for, especially we live in the 21st century. And they were in a surprise uh, that, you know, we have all this support in Sheboygan County. I mean, Sheboygan City is different uh, from the area of Westburg. Westburg, you know, we found out that it's a community, uh, family-oriented farms, they live there, and sometimes, you know, we find hard, you know, to understand that we live in 21 century, and there is the community, it's mixed, it's not one colored community, there is many. And one of the question, you know, I, I will go back to that meeting also to, I remember one of the question, one of the reverends, he said that, he said, your community moving with you, what a crime are they gonna bring with them? And it was puzzling for me, you know, a community like us gonna bring crime, and I said, you know, what do you mean, you know, by that, you know, crime? It was puzzling, you know, he thinks that these Muslims, they are criminal, they are thugs, and it was hurt, you know, for me to hear from him. And in the end, you know, we had, we had discussion many times, three times, uh, back and forth, and right now I'm just reporting to you that their chairs invite me to speak in their chairs, to give a speech about Islam. So we, we are trying to bridge the gap between the communities, because we believe in the end uh, there's a good people in every community, and there's bad people, but that's minority bad people. The good people, you know, you have to put in your mind, if the bad people, they never stop breaching what they're breaching. Why, as a good person, to stop breaching what you breach? You have to do that, you have to push in that. And, and then we have that meeting with them, and hopefully, you know, in May 1st, I will give the first speech, you know, in uh, that church. It, will that be the Presbyterian or the Reformed? That's Presbyterian. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and the, just a footnote on, on what you face in moving into that community. I, I heard a little bit about it, and uh, that there's a bumper sticker there that says, if you're not Dutch, you're not much. So there's uh, a little bit of prevention. Actually, actually you know, one of the, <laughs> their reference wrote in, the, in his Facebook that uh, he considered you know, the town his town. He said, welcoming a Muslim community to my town as welcoming you know, the Hitler youth to the United States. So he make comparison between us and the Hitler youth, which is, was uh, unbelievable to hear that. You are, you are telling people, you know, Bosnia and Ukraine, which they went through horrific, you know, time, persecution by the name of religion. Uh, thousands of them died and they escaped, you know, to have a better place. And then, you know, they have to face the same thing and the same the same mentality. Because we believe what you come from your mouth it has effect. People they take it and they act on that. Not everyone they have that capability to analyze and to be just rational, you know, in their action. And these people, leaders of faith, their words can uh, can make a huge difference and can make you know a problem in that area. And we call him about that. And he he, uh, after that, he would draw that statement and he came from the case, but it, it did damage, it made damage. Uh, this will be my last question before we open it up to the audience for their questions and comments. Um, you've told me and I've read that, uh, and you've just indicated now that over the, the last year, things have been gradually getting better. And I'm not trying to say perfect or, but better. And in the, in the media, it was reported this way, um, and this was quite a while ago, but it was reported as a, a turning point. Uh, Time reported that it took a tragedy to bring Muslims and non-Muslims closer together. In June, Sophia Khan, a Muslim girl from Chicago, disappeared in Lake Michigan near Oostburg while on vacation with her family. Rita Harmeling, a local woman from a church that had opposed the mosque, called the imam and asked him to minister to the grieving Khan family. 
later Harmeling helped volunteers and rescue workers who tried to find the girl. Soon other residents opened their homes to the Khans. A neighbor of the mosque offered the use of his front yard for the girl's family to gather. Actually, I will add that Norida, she opened her house for the Khan, the Khan family or the Khan family. She opened her house for a couple of weeks completely. Upstairs, downstairs, in the basement, they sleep uh, in tens of them. And she came to me and she said, I thought all the Muslims, you know, they are terrorists. And I found myself welcoming the terrorists in my home. And they are the best. So they had, she built a relationship with them. And she changed her mind in, in how to view Muslim and Muslim family. We, they have you know, degree, they have you no know, moment, they have. They are not what the media uh, just showed it as a terrorist step. So when she called me, she said, listen, I'm against the most. This is the first thing she said. <laughs> but I want you to be there. There is a grief, there is a family lost their daughter, and your present will make a difference. And I was there at that time. So uh, to come from here, and we invite her a couple of times, she showed up at her view and her husband, and I believe some of her neighbors could change. And that's how it takes a tragedy to change people's mind. But it shouldn't. You have to view people, you know, their differences as they are people, human beings, and to treat them according to how they, they act with you. Don't judge what is their heart or in their mind. You, you judge the people how they act, how they appear in front of you, not what's in their heart or in their mind. You are good or bad. And that's the basic in Islam, to judge people how they are act. Thank you, Mom. And now I'd like to open it up to the audience for comments and questions. Um, I wanted to ask you, when you took your story to the media, um, was it easy to do so? Uh, was the media receptive? And how did you find the media? So, you know, that initial point where you wanted to let the media know what was going on, how was that experience, please? You know the media, they like these stories. <laughs> it's a, it was a, a good time for them. Actually, you know, in, in days, some days you know, we had four, five, six, and you know, broadcast channels, you know, they are in the bottom a lot before I get back from my work. And I wasn't prepared myself, you know, just fighting from Milwaukee, from, uh, uh, from Green Bay. And we had, you know, uh, from, uh, also from New York calling, and, uh, and then, you know, ABC, the point point they show up also uh, for a program. So it was, the media, they like these things. And sometimes the media, they make it, uh, they make it more what it should be. Because a, a question of uh, Muslim and Islam, and this is all the story in Tennessee, in New York, it was it came in all of them in the same, in the same time. So it was, uh, they want to find a spot in Wisconsin to make the headlines of the news. So yeah, it was, it was hard, tough time. And uh, we were uh, debating whether you know, we should you know, continue with the media. But we are open society to the media. We have nothing to hide. So we speak freely about our feeling, how we feel about our organization, how we feel about that we are living in Wisconsin in this day. And we explain who we are as a Muslim. And it was a good for us. It opened the dialogue in community, which is they needed. We found it, they needed between them more than you know, needed you know, dialogue with the Muslims. We found that the, the community, they need that dialogue to understand and to open their mind. What they are doing is not harming just Muslims. They are harming their own products. They are harming all their own uh, Christian, you know, uh, that they are different from them. So we found it very helpful and healthy to have that. Does that answer your question? Other questions? Um, talking about some hostile environment in Chibuligan, have any families moved because of this? Or is it, uh, I'm sure it's a galvanizing thing in the community, but I'm sure there's some pressure out there that uh, just wanted to touch upon. Uh, 
to my knowledge, you know, family, no family, they moved. There is maybe one or two, they moved because just their jobs. But did the, some family, they start coming to the mosque? Yes. We have numbers, you know, family, they, they are afraid so far. Until we have, in spite we have the approval and the permits, and we see that the law enforcement is present in that area. In spite of that, still they are afraid from the hostile you know, environment because they don't know. They don't know what other side they think. Because we did, still we feel there is a gap and there is a bridge we have to build it. Might be, you know, in May 1st, when we had the first speech, it opened, you know, other dialogue with other chairs in that area. It could be, you know, a, a, a new start, you know, between communities in that area. We had spoken prior to this interview about building bridges and ways of getting better PR for the Muslim community, and I was just wondering, uh, in addition to speaking engagements, uh, have you had any other ideas? Uh, we are involved in an uh, organization, uh, Ministerial Association, which is a group of uh, reverends uh, in that area, over 32 of them, some of them professors in our schools, uh, we have dialogue in monthly basis, and that dialogue uh, we have it through these meetings, uh, these meetings, and they reflect back to their own community. We find more like uh, people coming to know about this now. Um, I have many family they come and they want to know what the Islam, what the Quran, and we see that uh, I have speeches in Sheboygan, many churches in Sheboygan, uh, until both Washington actually. So to find a lot, you know, so they invite to limit all this area. They start opening, you know, their their idea to know what is man and what this Muslim community, and that's how we should, you know, before you judge, you have to investigate. Most of the comments we find that you know that's regarding opposing, you know, the, uh, the Muslim community, it comes from uh, not searching or not asking. All the, the good comment, it comes from people they are interacting with the, with the Muslim thing. From people they are, they listen, they, they, they ask these questions from, from Muslims. They travel maybe you know, to Muslim countries. So that's the difference between people, you know, they don't want to interact with different faith group to have these questions to be answered with other people, you know, they are, they want to. Know. And that's as soon as you start to interact, these bridges and these gaps between community will be filled. One of the best ways to get to know people, of course, is through their families. Do you mind if I talk about your family for a minute? Or ask you about your family? Yes. You do mind? I don't mind. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just checking. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you are, you're married and you have two sons, one eight and one five? I have a son and a girl. A son and a girl. Okay. Yes. Right. And which now I need to know which one is eight and which one is five. And the girl, she is eight, and the boy, is six. Oh, now he's six. Okay. <laughs> yeah, now he's six. Okay. Um, so uh, you told me something that that surprised me, and I'm going to I'm going to uh, bring it up, and that is that your wife is Catholic. Yes, my wife she's a Catholic, and uh, based on that Islam, you know, it's allowed for Muslims to get married, you know, for the people of the Pope. And uh, we have been married the last ten years. We have two kids. Our our marriage based in agreement, as it should be. Any marriage should be agreement. You know, what he writes, what my rights, what my duty, what their duty, and that's in the Islam. Islam is uh, the marriage is agreement, and we decide that to raise the, the kids as a Muslim, and she agree about that. So we have we have this uh, mixed interfaith marriage, uh, ten years successful. We have. Uh, up and down as any new couples, but uh, uh, we reach the point that we are wise enough you know, to solve our problem and differences in spite of the fact, the media and things. We have discussion in a daily basis in many things. But uh, she knows about us now uh, more than the average Muslim. <laughs> in some ways it sounds like a very American family. Yes? You live in America, you have to be American, you know? I guess uh, I don't know where we are with the schedule, so I don't. I want to be mindful of the time. How are we doing on time? Oh, good. More questions.
Uh, so far, you know, my, my daughter, she's eight. <laughs> you know, but uh, from the experience we had, you know, oh, my sister-in-law, she finished her high school here. And uh, when she went to the school, she had this scar. One of the kids came to her, she said, which gang you are for? <laughs> so he was, he don't know what scar that means. When, you, when we used to live in uh, at Limit, my kids, they used to go to the public school. And my son, all the time, he came to me and he said, I have a problem, Dad. I said, you know, what's the problem? He said, they cannot pronounce my name. <laughs> His name, Obeda, which is uh, in uh, Biblical, you know, Obadiah. You know, you find it in uh, Genesis and, you know, uh, Bible. And they cannot pronounce so they would tell him Mr. Hamad. So it's much easier. You see, I pronounce all of their names, but they can't pronounce my name. I'm terrible for that. <laughs> so he was very nice. My daughter is just more like three girls, which is uh, easy not to pronounce it. Uh, in public school, I don't think you know they have problem. It depends personality. I think they have good personality and uh, I, I didn't see any of that problem, you know, being in public school. They are in public school. But for now, since we moved to another city, they are going to Milwaukee school, uh, which is, uh, that's a uh, private school. And they have no problem with that one, so. You started asking them personal questions. This is a conflict and resolution in our question, <laughs> which is another topic. Yeah, today it's 15, actually. Uh, I'm following the news. Uh, at a personal level, uh, I have been affected by that many times. I have family, they have farms, they lost the farms. Uh, the story starts from 1948, when my grandfather died when he was 39 years old. So it starts all the way until uh, recently, 2002, when the last farm that my dad, he had, it's gone. It's out of uh, trees, and so it's, it's gone. So uh, this is from land lost, from houses. I have two sisters, their house is destroyed, uh, which is they live right now with the fam in the family. Uh, from uh, losses of my cousin, I have the largest invasion in 2008. I have two cousins, they died while they are in their house. So it's not, you know, in the front line fighting. And uh, so it's an embarrassing level. Uh, it's a, a struggle. And if I, I tell you that, you know, I'm not affected by that, I'm not thinking, and sometimes take me uh, thinking of uh, my work, not focusing 100%. Yeah, I have been that, you know, when I see this in news, I have family there, I have friend there, I have extended family, hundred family in the village. It's like Oscar, you know, it's extended. It's a farming area. We have over 5,000 people there. So everyone, you know, uh, a very huge family. But uh, I live with a hope that tomorrow is better than, you know, today. And that's how you have to move. I, I, I live with the, with, the, with the hope that our government here, you know, can push uh, certain agenda and to, can make some kind of resolution in that conflict. We have the means in the United States to do so. I know that the other side is not listening, but we have the need to do that. How do you, um, this is a question, I'm not quite sure how to frame it, but you're, so as an imam, do you feel uh, constrained from speaking out or speaking up about uh, the situation in, in Palestine, about Gaza, about US involvement, about Israel? Is, does that put you, well, that's a very difficult position to be in. Uh, that's one of the things, you know, in a community uh, meeting in the town hall, one of the, uh, who's against the mosque, he say, we want to know that what they view is right. He want to ask us, you know, how we view Israel and how are we supporting Israel or not. Uh, we find ourselves, we are not the only one Muslim community against occupation. There is many American, Christian, Jews, they are against you know, the occupation also. 
It's not that it's just the only thing to train Muslims, they are against the accusation. There is a Jew, they are they vocal against Israel and against the accusation and what they are doing in the Kibai territory. So when we raise our voices, this is our rights, what's right and wrong, and we have to do it. This is the last thing I'm gonna come and as a Palestinian say occupation is good for the Palestinian. You would not expect that from me. <laughs> and you know, I speak, I speak my mind, uh, fairness, and I, I, I'm a person that I see that there is a hope because uh, in the future, you know, their generation comes, comes and comes, and no one, whether from the Israel side or the Palestinian side, they want to raise their kids for a war. So the Palestinians, they reached that point, but so far the Israelis, they did not reach that point. Yes. Okay, and it's been doing so since? Since May 17, okay, so once, once 2000, yeah. uh, yes. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about um, what you learned from that entire experience, what you, what you uh, or the society, or the Islamic society in Sheboygan might, might have done differently or would advise others to do who might want to establish mosques elsewhere and anticipate perhaps uh, uh, similar kind of opposition to what you experienced in Sheboygan, in Osberg, whatever. Uh, could you speak to those things? I don't, if I go back to that, what I will do it differently, I will do it the same way as I did it. First of all, extending my hand to the neighboring, to the leaders of faith, to discuss with them our goals, to interact with the community at the town hall, to express what, our, what we need. And this is maybe, you know, if I want to advise, advise many Muslim community to investigate the, the circumstances or the area that where they want to establish their mosque before go get through that. I learned, you know, in spite of that, these facts, you know, I learned that, you know, we are a country of law. We are a country of law. Whatever, you know, my view and your view, in the end, the law will prevail, and the Constitution will prevail in the end. So, whatever, you know, went through that, we have faith and believe in inside our hearts, that's the Constitution is the winner in the end. It's not, you know, the Islamic society of Sheboygan or the other community in Osberg, you know, they are the winner or the loser. It's the constitution that won that debate. Is that answering your question? Yes, introduce uh, Nick Idrisi, is that correct, uh, from the Islamic Society of Kenosha. And um, I'm just wondering if uh, what you've been hearing so far, what stood out for you, and, and if you have any comments or questions for the Imam. Yes. Um, very interesting program. First time I've been here at Park Slice. I've been here many years ago. I know uh, Professor Khan. She gave me first the uh, economics 101, I remember her. But it's very interesting. Um, I have a, uh, I want to make clear two points here that uh, I think a couple of the audience people asked before and they haven't been made clear. One was about the hijab and the other one was, uh, I guess, the, the perception of Muslims, how America views the Muslims in general, you know. I know as the Imam, the question, uh, explain to the audience the concept of hijab, first of all. The, the, that's number one. Is it a religious issue? Is it a traditional issue? Is it a time frame between 
let's say for a woman, is it for starting the age of 9, age of 10, 12, and so on. And then my other question is, with the Sheboygan uh, uh, mosque there, how the community perceived the Muslims as, uh, as you stated, um, uh, in negative uh, manner or in negative way. Uh, how do you, I guess the question was asked, how do you uh, bridge this gap further by inviting leaders of the community in the mosque? For example, in our Kenosha community, we're trying our best to invite people from different uh, uh, churches or different communities to come in and actually see the Muslims in action while we pray, while we preach, while we interact with each other. So are you trying to kind of show that to the non-Muslims uh, as they have portrayed us in a negative manner, as to uh, uh, bring them close to inside our home or inside our masjid or our mosque and to, to perhaps, perhaps show them that Muslims really are just like any other people that live in America. They're Americans but with different faith. Uh, but overall, the, uh, I'm really excited about this program. I have learned a lot and in a, a lower level it's excellent, but I wish and I hope that these kind of programs and these kind of uh, activities go further higher in, in a higher capacity hopefully to have uh, more often to have this type of programs or in a, uh, perhaps we cannot reach national level of course we will not be able to have a, a muslim scholar and fox news or other media but at least <laughs> at least in uh, to start our own communities to interact with non-muslims but rather than having only forums at parkside or Carthage college or other areas let us bring people in our own mosques, really interact. We go to their churches, they come to our mosque and kind of create this, this kind of uh, harmonious type of, uh, not a debate, but dialogue between, between uh, the two groups. We have that actually, you know. Uh, but let me cut you off a second. I would like you to explain the concept of hijab because they've been asking the question and we're going back and forth, back and forth, and I would like them to, to really understand the concept of hijab. Thank you, thank you, sir. The concept of the hijab, it has a uh, different view between scholars. And uh, we should view it, you know, for uh, the Muslim, it's a, a woman's choice. Uh, Allah Azza wa Jal said in the Quran, He said that, you know, uh, Tell them, you know, to put the scarf in modest way, you know, to the wife and the believers, women, and to keep you know, their hair and discover. Some of the scholars, they go beyond, beyond that, you know, they say that it's modesty, it can, you know, the hijab to prevent harm for a woman. But if the hijab can bring harm, so it should be taken, you know, somewhere. But we have to view it, you know, why if we see a nun with a scar, we say she's a religious person. And when we see a Muslim woman with a scarf, she's oppressed or pushed down or her husband or her brother or her father force her to do so. It's, I believe it, it's a woman's choice with advice. You, know, you advise for what based you know, the religion itself. And we have you know, the Christianity actually. If you go to the Christianity the beginning, the nun, they have the scarves and actually uh, and that's in, in all of that. Uh, actually, the Jewish community also, they have the scar. So it's not different from the Muslim community also to do so. That's in, in, the, in the issue of the scar. The issue of uh, breaching you know, other community we have. Actually, we open, you know, we have open house every year. And we involve in these, as I said, with the ministry, association ministry in, in Sheboygan, which is we open dialogue. And we invited many times during Ramadan for a talk, which is when you break your fast in the evening, many organizations to come and to share with us what we practice in a, a holy month of fasting, what we practice from uh, habits and tradition and food and, you know, prayers at the same time. And we find people, you know, they come and they learn. And we have very good people, you know, they write back, you know, to the news. I have very good experience. So we have this program, but in... Uh, 
in a bigger scale levels like in a weekly basis we don't have it as i said before we have very small community most of the world in the shoulder of a few and they have full-time job these few but we are able you know in a short time to achieve for that small community what we suppose we do is that answer the question yeah. i'm going to invite uh, everybody now to take a walk with Roseanne Mason and Faye Kendays and, and the other folks here to the alumni room and follow them to find out where it is, where we're gonna have some refreshments and some dialogue. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much.